Yeah, just to give folks a little bit of background how I got into this, I, I actually, my educational background is electrical engineering, and uh, I've always been a science geek and interested in quantum physics and consciousness and, and just understanding how the universe works and how everything works. And so eventually that led me, I worked in the medical system for about 23 years, worked at the uh, patient level in hospitals, I've worked in laboratories, I've worked in healthcare administration at the state and national levels in the United States. And so I've had a, a lot of exposure to health and the medical system and engineering and science and just a really um, broad background of things. And so that led me ultimately to um, natural health and learning how to heal myself and then uh, healing others. Uh, and because I'm an engineer, it's not the typical kind of person you're going to go to with health issues. Typically, the people that came to me were the most desperate. And so I'd wind up getting clients with, you know, deadly illnesses like cancer and things like that. And so uh, I wound up studying with some of the top healers in the United States and around the world and uh, had a very high success rate. Uh, up until 2012, I stopped doing consultations because I just got too busy to work with individuals. And I started working with groups and uh, teaching. And so that's kind of how I got into healing. And then because of my background in engineering, um, I wound up years ago developing a technology um, that puts out a field similar to what a pyramid puts out that will help protect against EMF and improve sleep, EMF being electromagnetic fields, protecting, um, uh, de-stressing the body and allowing you to get into deep sleep, improving meditation and all kinds of stuff. And so that set me on a quest of understanding the physics of it. And that led me ultimately to pyramids and, and meditating with pyramids. Um, I wound up bumping into the Dr. Sam Osman Agic, the man who discovered the Bosnian pyramids and uh, wound up uh, working with him and being on a team of engineers and scientists studying the Bosnian pyramids and their effects on healing people because people would go into these tunnels uh, around the pyramids and get healed of major diseases. People that have been told they only had 30 days to live, that had lung cancer, and it's very serious stuff. And so uh, between my work, and also I developed a little small electrically powered pyramids for EMF protection and sleep and, and other benefits. And, uh, and then ultimately wound up developing a larger device that is actually very, very similar to a pyramid. It's just much smaller uh, electrically powered device that will clear air pollution out of the atmosphere for uh, about 130 kilometer or 75 mile radius. And uh, it balances the weather. When you clean the pollution out of the atmosphere, it balances the weather. And uh, here in Florida, for example, it stops hurricanes. So I've had a lot of experience in very esoteric science and, um, and mysticism. And uh, also back in the 90s, I worked with free energy technology, water fuel and other technologies that could power everything on this planet non-toxically and, and clean up the planet very quickly. And so I've, I've had access to a lot of advanced technologies and seen a lot of advanced physics and mathematics that most people aren't privy to. Um, also had, you know, met people in uh, the military and government agencies that are working on very advanced technologies. And so all of that uh, background, uh, ultimately too, I, I, years ago, I got introduced to Vipassana meditation and that set me on a path of uh, meditating and learning about meditation. And so, so all these things kind of came together and I started um, realizing that there's actually a lot of science done on consciousness and meditation and pyramids and how they work together. And so, uh, so that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. So let's get started. So the physics of pyramid energy, what is it and what can we do with it? You know, because it's great to know all of this physics and pie in the sky stuff, but uh, it's kind of like Patrick said to me <laughs> one time, he said, science doesn't matter, just meditate. And he's right. Uh, he's absolutely right. It's like, it helps and it's nice to understand what's going on. But in the end, the only thing that matters is that we actually just do this, that we sit and meditate and particularly meditate with pyramids. But it is nice to know what's going on so that we can optimize what we're doing. So that's kind of what I want to be covering. Um, so first of all, I want to get into some fundamentals 
of uh, a few things in physics and chemistry that will help to understand uh, what I'm going to be talking about with these with the uh, practical applications of using pyramid energy. Uh, so the first thing I want to introduce you to is something known as monoatomic elements or monatomic elements, also known as ORMIS or ORMIS, which is just an acronym that an American uh, came up with for orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements, uh, whatever you want to call it. These minerals have been known for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, India has a very, very long history of knowing about this and teaching about this. All the great masters in India knew about this and taught and teach about it now. Um, and these minerals are in a very, very different form than normal minerals. Uh, normally, you know, minerals are basically just a bunch of atoms bundled together or connected together in some kind of three-dimensional grid that creates the um, molecular structure of the minerals. But with monoatomic elements, you actually have an element, which is a mineral, that where the atoms are discrete and they're not connected to each other. So they're, they're actually individual atoms. Each particle of the element is an individual atom rather than thousands of atoms bundled together in a particle. And so when you have that condition, you get a radically different appearance uh, of these minerals. So for example, it's been discovered that the platinum group metals on the periodic chart, uh, rhodium, iridium, osmium, platinum, um, osmium, all these, uh, these platinum group metals, gold, silver, mercury, copper, iodine, and a few others, they can all exist in this form of individual discrete atoms per particle. And when they're in that form, they become white ceramic powders. And we're very familiar with what gold and silver and mercury and copper and some of these look like normally. But interestingly enough, when you break them down into individual atoms, they all become white ceramic powders. And they have very, very weird properties, very weird physics. For example, liquid mercury, which we're all familiar with, um, when it becomes monoatomic, it also becomes a white ceramic powder. And we know that mercury metal, the normal liquid mercury is very, very toxic. Whereas when it's in monoatomic form, it's very, very healing. And that's the case actually with all of these monoatomic elements. When they're in this monoatomic state, they're very, very healing. And we're gonna get into why in a little bit. Uh, and India has a very long history of utilizing this. Um, some of you may have heard of the Shiva Lingam uh, which is uh, some gurus will actually mix herbs and use certain techniques with mercury and sometimes other metals, and they will convert it into this white ceramic powder, and then they will feed it to people or feed it to plants, and it will heal people, and it will make plants grow incredibly strong and healthy. And a lot of these uh, gurus hiding out in the um, mountains and caves and the Himalayas and places, they know all about this stuff, and they, they utilize this stuff in their own work. And it can be used for a lot of different purposes, which we're going to talk about. One of them being, interestingly enough, projecting consciousness. Uh, I've met gurus uh, high in the Himalayas who have very, very large orbs of these monoatomic elements that they use as a superconductor to project their consciousness around the planet and send their energy out and their teachings out to their students all around the world. So there's a lot of really interesting uses for these elements. Um, they're not regular matter. They're this really weird multidimensional matter. Now, of course, all matter is really multidimensional, meaning it exists through different frequencies of time and space or different dimensions, if you want to call it that, of time and space. But in the case of these monoatomics, they're about four fifths of the element is actually existing simultaneously in other dimensions or frequencies of time and space. So part of it's here in our physical reality and part of it is out in these other dimensions of time and space. It's kind of like an iceberg where we just see the tip of it in physical space. And you can actually heat these elements up and they will actually disappear. They will become invisible, but they will still have effects uh, like weight or anti-gravity and all kinds of things. And they, they actually are anti-gravitational. So normally when you've got true monoatomic elements, they want to levitate. They actually want to levitate away from the center of the earth and, and levitate towards the sun. 
And so they're found in all around in nature. They're in plants, they're in soil, they're in water, they're in the ocean, they're in our bodies, they're in, in the bodies of animals. All living organisms have these elements in them and they provide some very important functions, which we'll talk about. Let me see here. Um, another important property of these elements is in this state, they can be superconducting, which means they can conduct electricity with zero resistance, which gives you some very, very unique properties and applications. Um, and that creates extremely strong fields. These monoatomic elements put out extremely strong electric fields and, that are known as Meissner fields. And these Meissner fields want to ground out to anything around them. And so you'll see certain phenomena with that, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, they're used, actually, militaries and space programs around the world know very much about this because it turns out they're used, believe it or not, in time travel and space travel. Uh, I've actually worked with several different people who have worked on time travel, anti-gravity uh, spacecraft for the U.S. military and the U.S. secret space programs. And India has uh, secret space programs use, utilizing these technologies as well. But because they're superconducting and they're what's called in physics terms, non-local, they exist simultaneously in all dimensions of time and space or multiple dimensions of time and space. So they can be used for interstellar communications because um, for example, radio waves are way, way, way too slow to be sending a signal through space to communicate with a spacecraft that's you know hundreds of thousands of light years away or whatever. So they've developed these techniques using these superconducting monoatomic elements and other techniques we're gonna talk about. Uh, for interstellar communications, for time travel, dimension travel. Uh, they can be used in agriculture, but they, they can be fed to plants and make the plants extremely robust and strong. You can actually feed them to genetically modified plants and crops and they will, or animals, and they will revert the DNA back to the original pattern, the original heirloom. And they're used in all kinds of uh, different engineering and for healing. Uh, like I said, you can ingest these things and they will increase what the body naturally does. We'll get more into more details on that, um, but it'll, it'll help cells regenerate and then you get healing. So where do these monoatomic elements come from? They, as I mentioned, they're all found all around in nature. They are created um, by microbial action in soil. Um, you know, plants can't uptake boulders through their roots. They can only uptake particles of just a few atoms of an element or individual atoms of an element through their roots. And so they have to break them down or something has to break those minerals down into particle sizes that the plants can uptake. And so what they do, plants actually secrete chemistry around their roots that attract microbes and bacteria that will break down the minerals that that, that plant needs for its nutrition. And so, so these bacteria, which are throughout soil, the bacteria in soil will actually break down uh, these minerals into what are called angstrom particles, which are particles of just a few atoms bundled together or individual discrete atoms, which are the monoatomics or ormus elements. And so the more ormus elements that you get in the soil and into these plants, the much stronger, more robust they are. And so, it turns out you can do certain things to increase those ormus elements because these monoatomic elements, these ormus elements are found in volcanic rock. And so when volcanoes erupt, they're shooting out huge amounts of these monoatomic elements. <clears throat> and you can actually see evidence of this uh, on YouTube, believe it or not. If you go to YouTube and you search on volcano lightning, you can see volcanoes erupting and shooting out all this ash all over the place. For thousands of miles, this ash goes out. And the ash is very high in monoatomics. It creates a superconducting Meissner field. And then it creates a huge electrical potential that wants to ground out. And so you see this lightning shooting up out of the volcano, not down into it, not down to the ground, but shooting up out into the atmosphere. And of course, scientists are baffled because mainstream science doesn't understand or recognize these monoatomic elements. Uh, the military and secret space programs definitely do, but mainstream science is not aware of these for the most part. And so uh, they don't understand how this can happen, but that's what's going on. And so these volcanic eruptions are actually a very, very beneficial thing for the earth where the, the earth remineralizes itself. You know, all these minerals get washed down ultimately 
uh, to the ocean. And so there's got to be a recycling process. And that recycling process is volcanism. Volcanoes go and remineralize the earth constantly as they erupt. And so while it may be annoying to air traffic, um, having these volcanic eruptions is a very, very beneficial thing. And typically when you're near extinct volcanoes, they're gonna have very, very strong fields and they're also gonna have a lot of very high ormus soil around them. And so food grown in this soil is gonna be very, very high in nutrition, very high in monoatomics and very healing and beneficial to the body. These monoatomic elements also are involved in photosynthesis and they allow this energy from the cosmos, which we're gonna be talking about, scientists call it skater energy. It allows this energy, this pyramid energy, to come into the plant or the animal or the organism and uh, allow it to recreate the cells and the structures in the body moment by moment. So it's highly key in photosynthesis. And uh, it also makes photosynthesis a, a very multidimensional quantum process. It's not just chemistry. There's all these energetics going on that are multidimensional in photosynthesis. You can also, and, and photosynthesis, by the way, will also create these monoatomic elements. Same thing with fermentation. You can actually ferment things. And particularly if you feed what you're, what you've, uh, you're fermenting, if you fed it or include minerals into the ferment, the fermentation will break these minerals down into angstrom and monoatomic particles. And there are things you can do to enhance that, like growing plants or fermenting foods in magnetic fields or doing things to the water, which we're going to talk about to uh, increase the monoatomics that the plants or ferments are, are taking in. So these, these elements have a lot of practical uses in gardening and agriculture and your kitchen and healing uh, in meditation, all kinds of stuff. Also these, uh, these elements can be made alchemically and India has a very long history of this, uh, of um, making these. And actually all around the world, ancient cultures throughout the world have a long history of working with these elements, knowing about it. Um, ancient people actually marked rocks that were high in these monoatomic elements. And uh, there are certain places like um, uh, in, in India, there are certain places that have very high deposits of these monoatomics. And so the, a lot of the gurus and, um, and shamans and people will go to these places and collect these. But um, any volcanic rock or mineral is going to be high in monoatomics, especially a younger one. Okay, so now pyramid energy. What is it? When we're talking about pyramid energy, um, what is it really? Um, there's been a lot of different names for it. What it really is, is light that's traveling infinitely faster than the, the conventional speed of light. You know, I was taught in engineering school that the speed of light is around 186,000 miles per second. Uh, and that is the conventional speed of light that we've been taught. But it turns out even the conventional light travels at different speeds. It can be changed slightly by gravitation and different effects. But it turns out this pyramid energy, this energy of consciousness, um, this energy scientists call scalar energy. Um, it goes by many different names. It's just light. And it turns out that when you look at atoms and you look at the, the atomic structure of atoms, you know, when you start looking inside the nucleus of the atom, um, some mainstream science, because they couldn't see and didn't understand the nature of matter and energy and the, and the nature of the atom, uh, they just make up particles and say that, that the nucleus of atoms are composed of smaller and smaller and smaller particles. And every time they find a new attribute uh, inside of atoms, they just create a new imaginary particle and, and pretend like that's how it really works. It's not actually how it works. It's been proven by heavy duty scientists, some of them Nobel Prize winners, that when you get down inside the atom, what you really have when you get below the proton and the electron and the neutron, you get patterns, geometric patterns of light that kind of slow down and coagulate into these uh, atomic particles. And so as we've been told, you know, everything's made of energy. Well, that's how it's made of energy. And specifically it's made of light. So we're living in a holographic universe. And even though it seems very sol solid and physical to us, and it is, 
um, when you look at the very, very fundamental building blocks of matter, it's all made of light. So we're living in a holographic universe. And this energy, it's really the energy of consciousness. We're gonna talk about where it comes from, but it's been named uh, many different things, uh, Kundalini, Chi, Prana, life force, biophotons, biofields, mitogenic rays, morphogenetic fields, orgone. Some of you may have heard of uh, Wilhelm Reich, uh, who uh, called this energy orgone. Uh, longitudinal waves, I think uh, Nikola Tesla called them longitudinal waves, tachyon energy, torsion waves and fields. Uh, I think that's Russian terminology, usually torsion waves. Uh, physical vacuum energy, another thing Russian scientists will call it, zero point energy, source field, many, many different names for this. But what it really is, it's light energy and it's the energy of consciousness. And it's been discovered in, in science that this energy, where does it emanate from? It's coming from, we don't know the ultimate source of it, uh, at least not scientifically, <laughs> but, uh, but scientists do know that this, this energy comes from the centers of galaxies. And at the center of every galaxy, there is a superluminal sun. And they call them a black sun because when this energy, because it's traveling so fast, you know, millions of times faster than the conventional speed of light, it's traveling so fast that it appears to be invisible or black uh, in the, out in space. And so our instruments don't pick it up as conventional light. Our eyes don't pick it up as conventional light. And so scientists will call it dark energy or dark matter or other things. But what it really is, at the centers of all galaxies, we have this giant superluminal sun that's emitting this photonic energy, and it's going so fast it appears invisible or dark to us. And so, you know, scientists will call them black hole winds and all kinds of stuff. But this energy comes out of the centers of galaxies, and it spirals as it goes. We, you know, we know that the from from telescope and satellite pictures that, that we've got and spacecraft pictures that we're living in a, in, in a galaxy and all the galaxies that we can see are structured kind of like a pinwheel. They've got this spiral shape to them. And at the center of that spiral, you've got this large superluminal black hole or sun. Uh, and then around that you've got, as that energy slows down, it becomes visible light. And it turns out it's been discovered that this light energy at the center of all suns and planets, you have black holes or superluminal suns or black suns at their centers. And it creates all these phenomena like gravitation and uh, the physics that we're familiar with. And so that energy coming from the, the black hole at the center of the galaxies emanates outward and it's relayed through the black holes at the centers of suns and planets outward. And so this energy spirals as it goes and it branches as it goes. And so it's spiraling and branching. That branching side is called fractaling. And so the whole cosmos is, is structured based on this flow of energy, this spiraling fractaling energy. And so we see evidence of this throughout nature, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more here. But this energy comes out of the centers of galaxies. It's relayed from sun to sun to sun outward as it goes. And it's also relayed to the planets. And so you've got this cosmic web of consciousness. This energy is actually the energy of consciousness. I liken it to God consciousness because it has an intelligence behind it. And that's been observed in, in scientific studies. And so it's not just regular old light. It's not even really, really fast light. It's really consciousness is what it is. And so this whole cosmos is a web of consciousness where this God consciousness, if you want to call it that, flows through everything and it slows down and it turns into matter and the conventional electromagnetic spectrum of energy that we're familiar with. And so uh, Nassim Harriman, who's a, an American physicist, has done a lot of work in this area. If you want to learn more about the physics of this and some really interesting um, scientific information about it. Nassim Harriman has some really good information on this. Now, as it turns out, um, as I mentioned, this energy flows through the cosmos. It's spiraling as it goes, it's branching as it goes, and it slows down and kind of coagulates into the matter and energy that we're familiar with, conventional electromagnetic energy. And so as it turns out, at every scale of the cosmos, we have antennas that kind of capture this energy and rebroadcast it. 
at a galactic level, a galaxy is a big antenna of this and circuit of this energy that's flowing in a donut shape. And, um, and so when it, it's traveling through the cosmos, when it comes to us, it's getting to us from the sun and coming from the black hole at the center of the sun, or the really what it really is, is the faster superluminal sun at the center of our sun. And as that energy comes out, it slows down, it becomes visible light and heat and all of that. And, uh, and actually that it, it actually becomes heat when it hits the earth's atmosphere. But um, so it's coming to us from the sun. It's coming to us from the center of the earth because the sun relays that energy down into the black hole at the center of the earth. And then it radiates outward through the sur to the surface of the earth. And so this is why you see these practices like Qigong and Tai Chi and yoga and the different energy exercises, meditation, where you're bringing energy down from above and bringing energy up from below from the earth. These ancient practitioners and masters understood this. They understood what was going on and they understood that consciousness, we are antennas for this God consciousness, this energy that's flowing through the cosmos and coming to us from our sun and earth. We capture it. We're an antenna for it. And so are all living organisms. And so you have these practices, just like meditation, where you visualize bringing down this column of light from above and bringing energy up from below. This is why we do those practices. It's because you're, you're using your consciousness to accelerate the flow of this energy, this chi or prana into the body. And so, all, as I mentioned, all living organisms have this energy or are antennas for this energy. And we're all, all living organisms are fractal antennas picking this up, meaning that they branch. We've got branching structures in all these living organisms. A tree is an obvious example where you see this branching of the tree and all these different segments of different links in the tree branches and the trunk and the stems. Those all are picking up this energy coming from the sun and from the earth and then grounding it down into the earth because the tree's got a root structure underground as big as the canopy of the, of the above ground. And so you've got this, this antenna that's collecting energy from the cosmos and from the earth and bringing it together and rebroadcasting it and imparting that energy into the ground and into the soil and charging the crystals in the soil. And uh, so you've got this huge galactic matter energy system, this circuit of this energy flowing through everything and it slows down and coagulates into matter. And then you see these fractal structures like trees. You also see it, for example, in insect antennas. Uh, there, the actual, the antenna that is in your cell phone, uh, is actually a fractal antenna. And what that means is it's got little segments that make up bigger segments that make up bigger segments. And, uh, that invention was developed from observing insect antennas. If you look at this, this insect antenna here from a moth, it's got all of these, these different splines. You've got the one long spline down the middle, and then you've got all these different splines coming off of it that are of different lengths that pick up different frequencies. And then you've got these little hairs on all of those that are all different lengths and pick up different frequencies. All an antenna is, is just basically a piece of wire or a segment of something, a certain length. And let's say you've got a piece of wire one meter long, then you're gonna pick up frequencies of one meter. So you can vary the length of a wire and create an antenna that will pick up different lengths. So this is the principle behind these antennas. So you get thousands of different uh, frequencies that can be picked up this way in a very compact space. And that is known as a fractal antenna. Now, years ago, when I was a little kid, I used to wonder, I was taught in school, you know, that electricity follows the path of least, least resistance, right? So why then does lightning follow this, you know, this jagged path down to the earth? Why doesn't it just shoot straight down in a beam to the shortest, highest point, you know, on the surface of the earth. Well, it's because this energy, this, this discharge of electricity is following the energetic patterns of the cosmos. So even though we can't see it, the whole structure of the cosmos is structured with this branching fractal structure. You can see it evident in coastlines, for example, as well as trees and plants and, our, and also our bodies. You know, when you look at the blood system, the blood vessel system, the lymph system, the nervous system, even the brain and cells, they're all structured in this branching fractaling structure. And so as it turns out in our bodies, our bodies have high deposits 
of these superconducting monoatomic elements in the brain neural pathways, in the DNA, uh, and in the nadis or the acupuncture meridians. Um, what the nadis are, uh, are little deposits of these superconducting monoatomic elements along the nervous system. And they correspond in Chinese medicine to the, the acupuncture meridians. And so it, the superconductivity there creates little black holes. So our body is literally a web of these black holes as above, so below. You've got a cosmos that's full of large black holes all over the place. You've got black holes at the centers of planets and suns. You've got black holes within the body. So the whole cosmos is a cosmic web of consciousness where this energy of consciousness, this skater energy flows through the, this, this black hole network. The DNA is loaded up with these superconducting elements, and it actually is an antenna that picks up this energy of consciousness and brings the pattern, the genetic pattern into the body. We've been told that the DNA is a genetic blueprint of the body, but actually it's the carrier of the blueprint. The actual genetic blueprint in any living organism is in the consciousness of the organism, whether it's a human being or an animal or a plant or an insect or whatever. The genetic pattern is in the consciousness of the organism and it cannot be destroyed because energy can't be destroyed. And so the DNA, which is a superconducting spiral antenna, fractal antenna, and by the way, this image is not accurate. DNA is actually doesn't have these smooth curves. It's actually angular. It's geometric. And this has been shown through everything in the cosmos, even the, the pinwheel galaxy, it's not smooth spirals. They're angled. They're geometric because the, the fundamental structure of the cosmos is geometric. But at any rate, the, the DNA is this superconducting antenna that picks up the pattern from the consciousness of the organism and then conveys it into the physical body. And so it's not the root source of the genetic blueprint. It is the carrier of the blueprint. And so if your DNA gets damaged, you can actually heal it by feeding it these monoatomic elements and it will regenerate the DNA in the cells and it will heal them and return them back to normal using the pattern of the um, consciousness of the organism. This was actually shown in a, uh, some, some research that uh, Dr. Thomas Bearden in the United States was doing. He's a preeminent skater physicist. And he was actually looking for a way to neutralize radioactivity and he was studying human cells. And he discovered that human cells will actually send a signal through the DNA back through time. They'll send a scalar signal, which is not only multidimensional, but it actually is also, it can travel through time. And so this signal went through, goes through time, picks up the genetic pattern from the consciousness of the organism when it was healthy, and then brings it back into the present to regenerate the cells. So that's how cellular regeneration happens. So therefore, if you feed the body or any living organism, these monoatomic elements, it's going to be able to do a lot more of that and cells are going to heal and regenerate much faster. So as I mentioned, the brain neural pathways are loaded up with these, these junctures and this creates superconductivity in the brain. The brain is really like a radio. It's a transceiver. It's picking up this God consciousness that's flowing through the cosmos and coming down to us from our sun and the other planets around us and from the center of the earth. And the brain's picking that up and then it's sending it down through the nervous system, through the pineal gland and through the structures of the body and creating a field around the body. The pineal gland is loaded up as it turns out with monoatomic gold and rhodium and platinum. And that allows us to have that third eye which allows us to interface with non-physical reality. It's simply frequencies of consciousness that are outside of the normal band of physicality, but it, it exists. And so the more that we, the more we do to get these monoatomics into our pineal gland through food and particularly living food and monoatomic elements um, and detoxifying the body and the mind and the emotions, the more that will open up and the more that we can see through the veil and interact with our guides or the cosmos or whatever other people, any kind of um, other type of consciousness. The pineal gland is your interface with non-physical reality. So as I mentioned, the nervous system, the brain is the radio. It sends the signal down through the antenna, which is the nervous system. And then it creates a field around the body, a skater field around the body. There's the uh, acupuncture meridians, the nadis uh, in Ayurveda. 
where this energy flows. And this is why they talk about doing all of these energy exercises and meditations and things to work on the flow of the chi or the prana through the body. It's because when you do that, you're opening up those meridians, those superconducting junctures and allowing the energy of consciousness to flow better. And when that happens, then you can recreate your body moment by moment more effectively. And you can also create your reality more effectively moment by moment. And so we'll do things like, you know, using acupuncture needles uh, or other techniques to mechanically open up those meridians when they get blocked. But if we're eating toxic food or, you know, breathing or ingesting toxins uh, or dead food, uh, that will clog up these nadis and these junctures. And then you don't get the flow of chi as well. Your health goes down a whole host of things. You're less alive. You're less awake and aware. You're less empathic. You're less compassionate, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the major ways of expanding consciousness and meditation is simply by detoxifying the body, drinking living water, natural water, uh, and eating living food. And this is something that's very important, I think, in India, because, you know, I was in India last year for about three weeks. And one of the things that really struck me was the lack of living food, which is understandable because you've got to worry about sanitation. And, you know, when I was there, I got food poisoning. I, I ate a salad, a raw salad, and I got food poisoning and I got sick. So I understand why there's not a huge prevalence of living food, but that is something that has got to be brought back to India. Uh, the ancient people in India ate a lot of living food. They knew about this stuff, particularly the masters and the gurus. They knew about this. And this is one of the reasons why they're meditating high in the mountains with spring water and eating food grown there, not you know living on the beach in Florida and that kind of stuff. There's a lot of these monoatomics in the mountains. There's fresh air, there's high ornus water, and they can keep their bodies cleaner there. Uh, there's reasoning behind this. So reflexology points as well are these superconducting junctures of elements. And this is why they connect the body through the nervous system, all these different points in the body. And this is why you can do, you can work on these points and heal things. Now, as it turns out in nature, there are uh, also sources uh, of these elements. Uh, volcanic mountains, for example, I mentioned volcanoes emit a lot of this, these monatomic elements, but even extinct volcanoes, mountains in general, if they're high in these volcanic minerals, they will actually act like a pyramid and they will create energy around them. They'll actually create a vortex up through the tip of the mountain that can be seen sometimes if you see in cloud formations like these, these are called lenticular clouds. And what you have here is these mountains actually create a, a field around them, but they also create a vortex coming up out of the tip of the mountains that will slice through the clouds and create these structures. And so whenever you see this, you, you can be assured that there's very beneficial energy around those mountains because the natural minerals create frequencies that are very healing to living organisms. And this is why living around the mountains, things tend to be cleaner and uh, better energy is because these mountains are putting off skater fields and skater vortexes up through their tips. And those vortexes are like a double helix, just like the DNA and they slice through the clouds sometimes and you see these effects. Um, Well, ancient people observed this, they noticed this. And so they decided to make their own man-made mountains. And so this is what pyramids are. Um, pyramids traditionally on earth, uh, you know, we've been told all kinds of stories about their origins, but I can tell you, I have a friend who is a Russian pyramid scientist named Valery Uvarov. And he was in the KGB many years ago and it was his job to investigate UFO incidents. And um, at some point he got taken up on a flying saucer with some human extraterrestrials that toured him around the, the uh, solar system. And he said, one of the interesting things that they showed him was that on all the planets and their moons in our solar system, there were pyramids that had been built by other civilizations, you know, a long, long time ago, probably millions of years ago, uh, but they were on every planet and moon in our solar system because one of the purposes of them is communication. So ancient people through meditation, through communicating with guides, through communicating with non-physical entities, uh, 
probably also having extraterrestrial contact, they gained this knowledge of pyramids and what they can be used for. And they started building them. They mimicked what the mountains were doing. They observed what mountains were doing and they built these artificial structures. So what is a pyramid? It, it's basically an antenna that captures this energy of consciousness flowing through the cosmos and coming down to us from the sun and up from the earth. And so they, they capture that energy just like an antenna and then they rebroadcast it around them in a donut shaped or toroidal field. And then they also send up a, a vortex, spiraling vortex up through the tip of the pyramid. And that can be used for many different purposes, which we're gonna talk about. Um, this is actually a um, Curlian photograph of the vortex of energy coming off of a pyramid. And you can see it's got that double helix shape just like DNA. So as above, so below, you see these recurring structures and patterns in energy and matter throughout the cosmos at every scale from the galactic to the subatomic. And when that energy slows down, coagulates, it turns into physical matter that a lot of times will have this structure. Now, ancient people knew about this stuff and they, um, they didn't know the physics. They didn't, you know, it's, it's not important to know the physics. It's just important to understand the concept so you can utilize it. And they would build structures that would enhance this energy just like a pyramid. A cone will actually capture this energy just like a pyramid will. And it turns out that this, this energy, this skater energy, this pyramid energy, it's best conducted by non-metals. So while you can build pyramids out of metal and you can conduct and do things with them, you need to understand the physics when you're working with metals. And so it's just much easier to work with non-conducting materials like wood, uh, leather, fibers, plants, whatever, stone, um, metal, you have to understand the physics when you're building it. And this is also why ancient people built these various structures to capture this energy. If you want to meditate and communicate with, with God, with others, you can do it in a pyramid, you can do it in a temple. Basically, we all are antennas for this consciousness coming from the, coming through the galaxy and coming from our sun and from the earth. We're antennas that pick it up, but we can get inside of bigger antennas and pick it up even better. And this is why we want to meditate with pyramids or being in a temple. These temples, when you look at, at these temples and you understand the physics of them, they are all made out of, guess what, high ormus monoatomic stone, stone that's high in monoatomic elements. And or in the case of, for example, Shiva lingams, when those Shiva lingams are constructed, same kind of thing. They can capture this energy and rebroadcast it very strongly. So you can sit and meditate around a Shiva lingam and get the same effect. Or you can go inside of a, a Tibetan stupa. Uh, made out of these materials are highly conductive of the skater energy. And then they rebroadcast it and they also create a vortex up through the tip. So if you want to communicate with God or other living organisms or whatever, any other form of consciousness, you're going to have a much better time of it if you're doing it inside of a large pyramid or a temple. And this has exactly been my experience coming to India and meditating in the large pyramids at Pyramid Valley and the Hyderabad Pyramid I was having all kinds of stuff coming in and connecting up with all kinds of consciousness and, and energies and information much more massively than just doing it uh, by, like by myself here in Florida. So this is why ancient people built these structures. There were many different uses, but that's one of them. Um, communication. Um, I was actually in Bosnia and they took me to an archeological site out away from everything out in the woods that only the locals knew about. And it was a, an obelisk that it was carved a very specific way, just out in the middle of nowhere. And the, all of the life around there was just magnificent. The forest was gorgeous and a lot of life and, and living organisms all around, beautiful plants and trees and just full of life. And, um, and as I was looking at the structure of it, just from a physics standpoint, I recognized that this device was, had been used for communication by putting a circle of people around it and then meditating and focusing on this thing. And they were able to communicate with other, not, not only other worlds and other dimensions, but also other people on earth. They were doing the same kinds of things. And so, and as it turns out, there was an archeologist on that trip who was psychic 
And she said that her guides were showing her the exact same thing, that people would sit around this obelisk in concentric circles and meditate and focus on communicating with whoever. And that's how they would communicate and get knowledge and information uh, from other places. Now, the ancient Celts actually used these towers to, um, to enhance uh, the area for agriculture and for life in general. Uh, it turns out um, it's, it's funny because archaeologists, a lot of times they find these structures and they don't have any context at all for, you know, what these structures were built for. And so they make up all these really ridiculous stories. For example, these Celtic round towers, you can see this tower on the left, very, very tall and way up at the top, maybe, you know, maybe uh, 20, 30 meters up, you've got this little doorway. And uh, archaeologists theorize that, uh, well, the ancient people, to get away from their enemies, you know, if their enemies came around, they would put a ladder up and climb in there and close the door and push the ladder away to be protected from their enemies. Well, that's kind of ridiculous because their enemies can just come get the ladder and burn the door down and get them. So that's not what's going on here. <laughs> These ancient Celtic round towers were actually built as skater energy antennas. They are made of high ormus stone. They have very specific dimensions, just like a pyramid, you know, a pyramid and these different structures can be tuned to different frequencies based on the size and the, the structure, the angles uh, and the dimensions of the structure. And so in this case, you know, as you see, you've got a cone up top, which captures this energy from above and below. These towers go a very specific depth underground, and then there are very specific height above ground. And so they are a skater antenna that captures this energy from the sun and the earth, and then rebroadcasts it for hundreds of miles around in the case of this, and also underground as well. So it imparts all these beneficial frequencies into the soil, which makes the microbes in the soil happy, and they can eat and produce, they eat more rocks and minerals and, and break things down and produce more nutrients that the plants can uptake. And then the plants are very high in these monoatomic elements. They're very high in nutrition. And then the animals that eat them are gonna be much more healthy and stronger and bigger. And in fact, that's exactly what you see when you go to places where these kinds of structures are in place, there's so much more life there. The plants are bigger and stronger, and more robust. The animals are bigger and stronger, and more robust. Uh, I was visiting my cousin. I was born in New Mexico in the United States out in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of Native American reservations out there. And I was going backpacking with my uh, cousin. And he said, he said, man, you know, if we can go backpacking on this Indian reservation uh, or Native American reservation, uh, he said, I don't know why, but all the animals and plants are bigger there. And I knew why. It's because they know how to nurture the land and do these things, build these structures and, and, and create monoatomics in the soil and be good stewards of the land. And so when you do that, everything works better. Everything's healthier. We see these structures throughout history, throughout the world, throughout different cultures, different religions. Domes are very good at capturing this energy, just like pyramids are. Uh, so are obelisks. So are spirals. So you see these spiraling towers. And guess what kind of materials they're made out of? They're made out of stone or concrete that's high in monoatomic elements. Quartz, for example. Uh, Mecca. Now, if you ever see Mecca, when it's, when it's in height, there's like 100,000 people. There's actually more all around there. But there's, Mecca will actually seat about 100,000 people. And, you know, Mecca is built on a mysterious spring that puts out huge amounts of water and it's out in the middle of the desert. There's nothing, there's no water around here except in the middle of this desert, there's this massively flowing spring that has this magic water that uh, they call Zamzam water. And I was actually sent a sample of this Zamzam water and I actually tested it and analyzed it and found it's very, very high in these monoatomic elements. And it's very, very structured. The molecular structure is very, very structured. So it's, it's basically a homeopathic remedy that's very, very healing. And when you ingest it, these monoatomic elements in it plug into the body and into these structures and into the pineal gland. 
and they raise the superconductivity, which makes meditation and prayer much, much more powerful because you become much more superconducting and you're able to bring in these energies of consciousness and these natural energies from the cosmos and in prayer and meditation. And then also you're able to manifest uh, more easily. And so you've got this giant skater wave vortex generator here, which is also something a pyramid does. You've got this big obelisk in the center that's made out of stone, that's high enormous. And then you've got these circles of people, hundreds of thousands or hundreds thousand people sitting around in a circle where each little fractal antennas that are capturing this energy from the cosmos and rebroadcasting it. And when we get together in ceremony, particularly if we're sitting in circles, individually, we create these skater vortexes. And when collectively, when we sit in circles, we create a bigger vortex. And that vortex of consciousness acts like a carrier wave for our own consciousness, and it will pick it up and accelerate it. And so this is why when you get together in groups of meditation or prayer or ceremony, you're accelerating the manifestation of thought into of consciousness and thought into reality. And so this is why when you do these kinds of events that you see things accelerate and things happen and things pop in your life is because you're, you're getting together and creating this skater vortex that acts like a carrier wave. And so these people are ingesting this high enormous water. They're doing prayer and meditation and connecting up with God, with the cosmos, with other consciousness and getting all kinds of information and answers and healing and all sorts of amazing things. And in India, you see the same thing. I mean, one of the things that struck me when I was traveling around India, Patriji was touring me around all these various pyramids that uh, he had helped build. And that was very impressive. But also I saw that the ancient people there, they knew about this stuff. They've known, I mean, India has been one of the most technologically advanced societies on this planet, the longest. Um, you know, we think that the United States is the most technologically advanced because in modern times we've got all this, you know, high tech and weaponry and stuff. But the reality is India actually has the most advanced technology because the most advanced technology looks like magic. You know, it doesn't look like, laser beams and you know fighter jets it looks like magic and so the ancient uh, indian cultures had very very advanced technology and you you guys probably know this this is in your scriptures and historical documents but when you see these different structures these temples they are skater wave generate uh, a skater wave antennas they capture this energy just like a pyramid does just like these other structures do and they bring it in from the earth and from the sun and the cosmos, and they also broadcast it outwards. And so when you get together in groups for meditation or prayer or whatever, this is what you're doing. You're connecting up with the cosmos. You're connecting up with other consciousness. You're bringing information and energy in. You can bring in healing, and then you can broadcast it outward. So it's very, very powerful. If you understand this, then you can put intention behind it and amplify the effects. Uh, this, again, this has been throughout different religions, cultures, you know, Gothic cathedrals are the same thing. They've been designed very specifically to harvest this energy and broadcast this energy to bring it in and to bring it out and to harvest it and collect it, quite honestly, uh, sometimes for nefarious purposes. There are also cities all around the, the planet that have been laid out geomantically as skater energy circuits to capture this energy coming from the sun and from the earth and from the people around, sometimes to harvest that energy, uh, sometimes to enhance it, but basically to create a circuit or a, um, a, a, a structure for the flow of the energy of consciousness to enhance, to either enhance the living people and organisms there or to harvest their energy a lot of times. So obelisks are one of these structures like pyramids that will capture this energy uh, the Eiffel Tower is also a fractal antenna. When you look up close at the Eiffel Tower, you've got all these little uh, different segments and each of those segments are picking up uh, different skater frequencies and grounding it into the earth and then broadcasting it upward just like a pyramid does. Um, same thing with many, many structures like the Vatican. You've got this obelisk at the center of a circle and then you've got these colonnades all made out of high ormus stone and what you've got here is a skater wave generator and harvesting station, to be honest with you. And I think I've been told by insiders, I actually know um, a, a priest who worked in the Vatican at the highest levels. He reported directly to the Pope. 
And he said that this is a energetic harvesting station. You have huge numbers of people that, that gather here in this circle. You've got this obelisk that will create a skater vortex. All these people are creating a big vortex, which these interdimensional beings can feed off of. And then it also, these colonnades direct all that energy into the Vatican, which the Vatican people then can then feed off of and utilize in certain ways. Uh, and I was told that also that these, these high Vatican officials utilize this because by feeding these interdimensional beings, these interdimensional beings will give the higher ups in the church information and knowledge that they can use to maintain their power uh, and control and profit, et cetera, uh, as a part of that. So this is actually something that has been done all across the planet and is still being done, not just with the Catholic church. So I'm not picking on the Catholic church um, control systems around the world have utilized this physics to enslave humanity and harvest and feed off of humanity. And so we need to understand this and we need to do the, use these things like meditation and pyramids to not engage in that. Uh, you see here the uh, US Capitol building, same thing, domes, colonnades. This is a matter energy system that's collecting this energy of consciousness and rebroadcasting it. Uh, the ancient Colosseums, what did the, the ancient Romans do? They put people in these big circles of high ormus stone, everybody generating these skater vortexes individually and then collectively creating one huge skater vortex. And usually they're watching something gruesome, some, you know, someone being fed to the lions or, you know, fighting to the death or whatever, creating a lot of fear energy. And this is, this basically is a big harvesting station or a feeding station for negative interdimensional beings. Uh, so we need to understand this. These can have very beneficial uses. They can also have very negative and nefarious purposes. And so we need to be aware of it so that we can avoid these kinds of things. Native people around the world also understood this and uh, they didn't know anything about the physics of this. Uh, well, not in the terms that I'm speaking in, but they, they did understand this. Uh, I've got a friend who is a Yaqui Indian chief and he came to my house and we did a sweat lodge with a group of people and it was interesting to hear him talk because he's explaining the purposes of everything that they do in this lodge. For example, the structures of the saplings, as opposed to using metals or other materials, saplings are conductors of skater energy or the consciousness of energy. And then you create a dome, whether it's out of leather or cloth or some non-conducting material that actually will capture this energy, just like a pyramid. And then when, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're sitting inside of it, you are an individual <clears throat> antenna for this energy. The lodge itself is an antenna for the energy and it captures that energy from the earth and the sun. And then you're sitting in a circle and you're creating a skater vortex that, that is larger and acting like a carrier wave for your own consciousness. And then it accelerates whatever it is you're focused on. And so this is why it's very important when you're meditating in pyramids or doing ceremony in groups or doing sweat lodges or whatever, it's very important to have clarity about what your intention is behind it uh, because it will accelerate the manifestation of that. And if you're doing these, if you're doing these, these uh, ceremonies or processes or practices uh, in these structures that are created by masters like Patriji, you don't have to worry about bringing in negative entities and those kinds of things because the entire structure and the way it's all formed and shaped, uh, it will pick up benevolent, loving frequencies and not negative stuff. So you don't have to worry about, you know, like going in meditating in a pyramid and getting possessed. They're tuned to frequencies that are very, very, very beneficial. And that actually will drive away negative interdimensional beings. Um, that's one of the things I was recently told by a, a psychic who I know that, that uh, helps eliminate entities from people and places. She said that the little power pyramids that I make will actually drive away negative entities. And of course, I know that from experience from living in a house surrounded by these pyramids. Um, but at any rate, you know, so these people get together you, and we can get together in circles, do ceremony, create these vortices and enhance each other's lives as a collective. OK, so now what do we do with this stuff? It's all nice to know about the physics of all this, but practically speaking, uh, what can we do? Well, first of all, we can meditate in pyramids. <laughs> and uh, I absolutely love 
Patruji, you know, I met him about uh, a little over a year ago. He came to Florida and spoke and uh, we wound up meeting and then did presentations together and just really hit it off. And he invited me to come to India last year, which I did. And that was an amazing, wonderful experience. The Indian people are so incredibly amazing and the country is so amazing. The history, everything there is just so incredible. And I, I know I've had lifetimes there. I've got memories of it. So, um, but at any rate, this man is, I, I am absolutely amazed at what he's been able to manifest in the time that he's been doing this uh, around the world and across India. And so you're very, very, very fortunate there in Pyramid Valley and in Hyderabad and all these other places where you've got pyramids uh, to have access to these things. I'm actually gonna be building a pyramid on my property to do this. I've gotta be kind of careful though, because one of the things that these pyramids can do is bring up water from the, from the ground because they'll actually pull on the monoatomic elements in the ground and levitate the water to the surface. And so, uh, so anyway, uh, here in Florida, the water is very close to the, to the ground. Um, but when you get in these pyramids, as we talked about, and you sit and meditate, it will, it's, it's a gigantic antenna and it will radically, radically amplify your ability to meditate and manifest. And so this is such a brilliant thing and such a loving thing that Patriji has done. And this is a major, this is the most important thing we can do on this planet is to learn to meditate and do these practices because the only way we're gonna change this planet for the better is by raising the consciousness on the planet. And when you see all the, term, the turmoil that's going on around the planet right now, that's exactly what's going on. It's kind of like, uh, an initiation into the raising of consciousness. And it doesn't have to be difficult or traumatic, but for people that are hanging on to the old paradigm, it, it will be. If you're, so we're fortunate in that we can be proactive and use these techniques to improve our health, to improve our knowledge and awareness, to have psychic communication, and basically manifest a life of joy and abundance. Now, it turns out one of the other things that pyramids can do is structure water. Uh, it can make water more healing because water is actually a homeopathic solution, meaning that you can do things to water and it will change the molecular structure of the water. And that molecular structure has patterns in it that when ingested will connect to the water in the body and it will convey information to the body and either trigger a healing response or a disease response. And so uh, I've gone to the Bosnian pyramids and spent a lot of time in them and I've you know, studied them and I've actually been on a scientific team measuring their energies and, and various aspects. And people are going inside these tunnels in the pyramids and they're drinking the water and they're meditating and they're getting healed of major, major life-threatening diseases. They've been told, you know, some people have been told you've got 30 days to live, go home and die. And they go in there and they drink the water and they meditate for hours a day and in a couple of weeks, they're completely cured. So very, very powerful. You can use pyramids for structuring water in this way, particularly if you have water with minerals in it and, these, and create these monoatomics uh, by vortexing water in a magnetic field. Uh, you can create these monoatomics and be, have healing water instead of just hydrating water. Dr. Mazaru Emoto actually studied the pyramid water uh, in the Bosnian pyramids and showed it had a very, very complex uh, geometric pattern and crystallization pattern. Now it turns out in Russia, um, Dr. Alexander Golod, who was a high ranking officer in the Russian military, uh, he was tasked with studying pyramids, presumably probably for warfare and uh, being a very benevolent person though, he wound up studying the positive uses of them. And he wound up building some very large pyramids, including this 244 foot tall pyramid outside of Moscow, or excuse me, 144 foot tall, and um, discovered a lot of amazing properties with it. One of the things people can go inside these pyramids and sit and meditate and pray, and they get healed of major illnesses. These are some large crystal uh, spheres that they put inside that will capture that energy and radiate it outwards. Now, interestingly enough, Golod built this pyramid out of fiberglass and wood and glue, absolutely no metal, not even nails, because he said that these non-metallic materials will conduct skater energy better. This is the inside structure of this pyramid. And you notice this pyramid also is a very tall, skinny pyramid. This is known as a phi ratio or phi ratio pyramid. You can tune, you can change the angles and the materials 
uh, of the pyramid to tune to different frequencies. And so this one is particularly good for healing and meditation and other things. Now, here's some of the fascinating things that Golod discovered about his pyramid. And you have to keep in mind that this guy had a budget of millions of US dollars uh, annually to work on this project and to study these things. And so he, and he also had access to top secret Russian technologies to analyze these things like a, a, a skater radar that could detect the, the energies coming off this pyramid. And what they discovered was for large areas around, uh, they were able, to, the, these, this pyramid would purify the water in the ground for hundreds of miles around and also purify the air for hundreds of miles around and also reduce radioactivity in the atmosphere, in living organisms nearby, and in the groundwater. It, any poison that's placed inside of it, it'll neutralize. When, when people or living organisms go inside, their immune system is proved, their cells regenerate faster, pathogens in the body are suppressed, on and on and on. Uh, seeds placed inside of them for just a few hours or a few days will increase the yields from 30 to 100%. Now here's an interesting one. It reduced the amount of earthquake activity in the area, lightning and severe weather. And this is because what these pyramids do, because they're bringing in this energy that can create an ultra matter, it will actually release the tectonic shifts constantly instead of letting them build up and release in one large release. And so you get these little micro earthquakes that nobody can feel constantly rather than having them build up. And so it reduces uh, earthquake activity. And then lightning, it turns out the field that this pyramid puts out and the vortex that it puts out above, it acts like a it acts like a tornado. It's like an upside down tornado of energy that actually goes out into space. And this skater vortex acts like a vacuum cleaner because it's tuned to certain frequencies that will pull only pollution out of the atmosphere and send it out into space or just neutralize it. And when that happens, that balances the charge in the atmosphere and then you get normal weather. Severe weather is just the, is just the earth trying to balance itself and balance the charge in the atmosphere. And so <clears throat> I've observed this with pyramids. You'll see this, you'll notice this around the pyramids in India, the pyramid and pyramid valley, the air around there and the, and the environment's much cleaner around there than other places. Um, same thing with the Bosnian pyramids, same thing with this, this device. I developed a little small device you can put outdoors and it'll do the same thing as a large pyramid. It's uh, electrically powered, it's called the home shield. It does the same thing for 75 mile radius. It clears the pollution, sends it out into space and then you get normal weather. And in the case here in Florida, we don't get hurricanes. The hurricanes, when they come near and they get, when they get near the field of this, they just fall apart and go away. So there, these things can be very, very effective for stopping cyclones um, in India. Now, uh, Golod discovered it'll heal the ozone layer. It'll lower the viscosity of oil in oil wells, increasing yields. They also noticed a lot of these springs were popping up for many miles around and uh, it's because they, they found out that the pyramid energy pulls on the monoatomic minerals in the water and the groundwater and pulls it up. This is also why na uh, ancient pyramids like the Bosnian pyramids, they have a lot of water inside of them. It's because it's pulling up this water from deep underground and creating monoatomic elements in it. And so they, they, they found all these springs popping up all around. And here's a really fascinating one that really gives me hope for humanity. Golod noticed, let me go back to that picture of the pyramid. Oops, wrong way. Golod noticed that there were all these flowers growing in the field that no one had ever seen before. And so they called in a botanist to have them identified and they discovered that the flowers had been extinct on earth for 11 million years. And so he theorized that these pyramids have the ability to go into the Akashic records or the quantum field, whatever you want to call it, which is timeless and bring in the pattern, the energetic pattern of these flowers or these extinct organisms and bring them into the present. And in fact, they've seen that with insects as well. So we potentially have the ability to bring back extinct species with pyramid energy. And uh, they put these pyramids in prisons. And as you guys know, where you're at in uh, India, you put these even little pyramids on the roads and it radically decreases like 70, 80% the amount of traffic and crimes and all kinds of stuff. There, so there's a lot of really beneficial um, 
uses for these pyramids. Uh, we're going to finish up here because I know we're running out of time. Dr. Valery Uvarov is a Russian pyramid scientist uh, and a friend of mine. I met him at the Bosnian pyramids. He has a lot of amazing knowledge and information about pyramids. He's a great resource. Um, he's built pyramids all over the world. He's built a large pyramid complex in Siberia and Russia with pyramids inside of pyramids and a complex of pyramids that he's turning into a pyramid community. And how amazing will that be? So th this is a, he's actually got a lot of these large pyramids already built. And he's noticed that it's affected the weather in beneficial ways and it's raising the consciousness of the people in the area. Dr. Samir or Sam Osmanagic, who discovered the Bosnian pyramids, uh, which appear to be the largest pyramids in the world discovered so far, according to him. I think there are probably some larger ones around like Mount Kalish uh, that haven't been recognized as pyramids necessarily. But at any rate, the Bosnian pyramids are amazing and Sam has done a huge amount to uncover these pyramids and to utilize the energy from these pyramids. They're laid out, there's actually a complex of pyramids, they're laid out geomantically to create an energy system in the area. And there's always water flowing around these. When you look at these ancient pyramid sites, they always had water flowing around them because the water is very key to generating energies that they utilize. This is just some of the structures at the Bosnian pyramids that mainstream archeologists were trying to say were just naturally formed and naturally occurring. It's so utterly ridiculous, it's, it's not even funny. Uh, these are walls inside the pyramids, dry stack walls and things. There's no way this could happen naturally. Terraces and sidewalks and all kinds of things and mainstream archeology is trying to suppress this and say that it all occurs naturally. Giant stone spheres made out of high ormus stone that put out very strong skater fields that are perfect spheres that we would even have a hard time creating today all around these pyramids for hundreds of miles around. Um, yeah, this was not naturally occurring. I developed a device, as I mentioned, this is called the home shield. It puts out a skater field in a vortex, just like a, a giant pyramid will. And so if you don't have the space or the wherewithal to build a giant pyramid, you can just build or get something small like this and uh, have the benefits of a large pyramid with you. Uh, it also pyramids, pyramid energy and the energy of these things will put out these skater fields that will also structure electromagnetic radiation and protect you from EMF, uh, improve sleep, depending on what frequency is tuned to. I've got these little pyramids that will improve sleep, do EMF protection, accelerate plant, plant growth, all kinds of stuff. You can build these yourselves. There's a material called Organite, O-R-G-O-N-I-T-E, that you can make yourself. You can go online on YouTube and you can see how to make this stuff. You can make them at pyramids and cones and different structures and improve meditation, structure water, improve the weather, all kinds of stuff. So, you know, you can do this yourself very inexpensively. These are just some little pyramids that I made years ago. And I discovered that these three little pyramids were clearing a five mile diameter of the sky around my house from chemtrails and air pollution, which is pretty amazing. So just three little pyramids can do this. And you don't have to have a giant pyramid. You can actually go on eBay, believe it or not, and buy pyramids that people that understand this are building pyramids out of metal and things using organite to travel through the pyramid system and create this energy. So anyway, that is my presentation and thank you so much.